A huge welcome to all those who just joined. We're giving folks maybe two or so minutes and then we'll get started. But in the chat, can you tell us one where you're calling from and what your favorite squash is? Oh, but I'm not delicata. Yes, that's a good one. Ooh, butternut kabocha, nice. Let me throw my name too. Okay. Hey, Damali. Oh, butternut. Yes. Hi, Isabel. Classic pumpkin. Nice. Unappreciated. Good, good. Hello, everybody. Um, if you haven't met me before, my name is Tutu. I'm the Youth Engagement Coordinator for Grow My Seas Green Market. And um, I'm also the person who puts together all of these workshops and really excited to see all of you be part of this conversation. Excited for Ethernet to be joining us as well. Um, before we get started, we um, usually, before we start our conversations, we, we start off with community agreements that we put together as a team, just so we have a shared understanding and a mutual understanding of how we're going to be engaging with one another during these conversations. I will read them out quickly. Um, we encourage you to step up and step back. Uh, please give room for others to speak. We'll encourage you to use the chat function, to also use the raise your hand um, function if you want to ask a question or to speak. Um, please trust each other's intention, but also acknowledge your own impact. We ask you to understand and respect everybody's boundaries, both physical and verbal. Um, please be clear and honest in your communication so we can make great decisions together. Speak up and reach out if you need any help. We are all in this together. Um, we invite you to have a mutual understanding of the importance of taking breaks. So take a break if you need to and allow others to do. As, so as well, please be open-minded and understanding. We're all coming from different backgrounds, lived experiences and perspectives. We encourage you to listen to the speakers, even if you don't agree. Um, we sorry. listen to speakers even if you don't agree please be patient open-minded and respectful please acknowledge the strengths of others and work collaboratively um, there is no hierarchy in this space uh, in terms of ages positions we want to respect one another and we also offer reciprocal feedback so that we make sure we're meeting each other's expectations. And in terms of tech specific ones, please keep your mic muted unless you're speaking. Again, use the raise your hand, raised hand um, icon or the chat to ask questions or um, um, share any thoughts that are coming up for you. And if possible, turn on your video. We'd love to see you. Uh, use that chat for your thoughts, responses, and questions. Please respond and challenge ideas, not people. And also respect the visual space. If you have anything behind you that's distracting, we ask um, that you either blur your, your background or turn off your video. And again, we will be recording this event. If you're uncomfortable with your face being in our recorded video, please feel free to um, turn off your video. But with all that aside, um, I'm excited to have this conversation. It's part of our food systems discussion. We, we are, we've been talking, last week we talked about food justice and this week we're talking about food sovereignty. If you had the opportunity to watch the video that introduces what the idea of food sovereignty is, that's great. But I'll also send it um, in a follow-up email for all of you who are attending. But without uh, further ado, I'm going to pass on to Ethanet. And can you let me know, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Hi correct everyone, <laughs> thank you to uh, Isanet or Isanet, if you have English speaking friends. Um, so good to be here with y'all. I haven't 
done one of these in a minute, but this is um, really exciting to be here. This is the work that I, I started to do back in the day. And yeah, it's just amazing to, to be here with, with young folks. Um, my name is Isana Batista. My pronouns are she, her, ella. And yes, I am Dominican <laughs> from um, Washington Heights. Um, I currently live in between the Dominican Republic, the North Coast, Puerto Plata, and New York City. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit more about myself um, in, a, in a little bit, but I, even, even though I didn't work for Girl NYC, I used to work at, the, at um, different markets then throughout New York City, um, like around seven years ago. Um, it was through the, through, the, through the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, and I used to do nutrition and education workshops in Harlem and East Brooklyn. Um, and I think I even did, did a, uh, a stand in, in Queens. So, so yeah, so good to, good to have that, that connection. Um, yep, yep, the seller markets, exactly. And so I'm gonna share my screen so we can get started. I also wanna um, recognize that uh, you all were sent a, a really great video about food sovereignty that really um, breaks it down very nicely. Um, so today I'm gonna try to get um, into a little bit of the history, get us to that definition and then um, bring us to how you all can be engaged in that work. Okay, yes. Uh, Tutu, can you share the video that you, thank you. So, so a lot of the work that I do is always through a racial and gender equity lens, um, just because it's really important to, to root us there and to, um, to make that connection, because if not, I feel that we are not not getting anywhere. Um, so today I want us to, to get into the true story of agriculture and food in the United States. This is a uh, true story is a, is, a, is a word that I learned from a food justice comrade, um, Paul Lebron, um, where, and I don't know where they got it from, but I learned that it's just a way to, to take a word that has um, a very um, gender, towards like what people understand as, as um, masculine and patriarchy in the word history. And so it's kind of taking it back and saying like, it's not his story, but it's actually a true story. Um, we want to examine food apartheid and the effects it has on ourselves and our communities and learn the resistance work that is happening. So we're going to basically go from a hard look, right? Uh, that could bring up a lot of a lot of feelings because the true story is not a it's not a it's it's not a story that has um, a lot of um, feel good moments. Um, yet there is there was a lot of resistance, um, and there's a lot of resistance today. And so we're gonna go through that. Then we're gonna go through just some important facts to look at. Um, and then we're going to also dig into just some language. We're also going to do some partner share um, to connect us to what is our own connection to this work, um, to food and to land. And then we're going to get into what is the work that's happening now that maybe y'all can engage in, in the same ways that I was able to connect to um, when I first started doing this work. Cool. Does that sound good? I got a thumbs up. So first, I want to ground us in, into this quote and, and into an acknowledgement of, of the land that I'm, I'm on personally. I'm currently on, on Lenape land, um, now known or now called um, New York, New York City specifically. Um, and I have this quote from Marcus Garvey that I learned from through some work with Soulfire Farm. It's a 
quote that they always use, a people who have the knowledge of their past history, origin and culture is like a tree without roots. It's also a term very no, very well known um, in, in, in what's African culture called Sankofa. Um, it's like this bird that's kind of like looking back. And so both of these um, ideas uh, have really grounded me and really connect me to, to just how important it is to con consistently be understanding your history because as, as we also know history repeats itself um, and we want to make sure that um, stories are presented as, as, as true and not under the um, rendition that that people at, with higher powers want to present it to us as. There is a great website and I should have gotten this link, so I apologize. It's a great website where you can um, put in the, the place where you live and I'll tell you the, the indigenous um, roots of that place. Um, I think it's called native.ca or C-O. Is someone putting it in the chat? Yes, thank you, exactly. So you can go in there and um, look up, look up where you're, where you're at, and you can put it in the chat if you wish to share that. Cool. So who am I? Um, like I mentioned, I'm Dominican. Um, racially, I'm a black woman. I was born in Harlem, but kind of grew up between Harlem and Washington Heights. So everything from like 135th Street and Broadway to like 181st. My family like moved around a lot, um, but my my grandmother and my family we still live on 135th and Broadway in Harlem. We've been living there since the early 60s. Um, I'm queer. I studied um, and worked in hospitality until 2014. Um, so I worked in different hotels starting when I was like 16 years old and also in different um, food and beverage um, companies and catering throughout college. And then I transitioned to be an educator. Um, so I really hated working in these major hotel companies that were catering to, to just affluent. Um, white people and it was just driving me wild and, and so I decided to transition to be an educator um, and I got to do that through the AmeriCorps program um, and then through that program I was able to immerse myself in um, kind of you know make connections immerse myself in food justice cooking and farming work which I was always really passionate about um, and then while I was doing AmeriCorps I created Woke Foods, um, which is a, an idea that I had um, at the time I was, in addition to doing um, education work, I was also community organizing with a few different groups. I was doing community organizing work with the Justice Committee and Cop Watch um, Harlem. I was organizing around um, anti-Haitian um, sentiment um, and a policy that had just passed in the Dominican Republic. Um, and so I was feeling just a lot of um, a lot of anger, a lot of resentment going into this work. And so I found that one of my healing um, practices and one of the ways that I was able to ground myself to do, to continue to do this work um, was through my was through my wellness and my and my eating and my connection to land. And so I had um, the opportunity to explore like how could I put foods in my body that were connected to my culture that were being grown um, in New York soil, but that were maybe also imported from the DR. And so I started exploring a plant-based vegan diet um, and it really supported me, it really supported me to like put whole foods in my body while I was doing community organizing work, while I was doing AmeriCorps. And then had like this, uh, because I was bringing a lot of food to work um, and to the, um, the different um, events that I would be attending, um, I thought about this idea to start this concept, this project called Walk Foods, where I could explore more um, all the intersections of food and land through my own cultural background, um, the Dominican Republic. And so I started that in 2016. And then with my grandmother and a friend, I found a program that helped um, local businesses um, by people of color 
make their businesses into this um, model called a cooperative business, which essentially is a business that is owned by its employees. So at that point, I had already been working with my grandmother, had already been working with a friend to prepare meals. It was like kind of like my side hustle and on top of doing um, AmeriCorps and community organizing. So I would prepare meals in my house. Um, sometimes I would cater events on the weekend. And so then I made it to like an official cooperative business in 2017. Cool. So now we're going to get into the true, the true story of how we even get to this place. Um, so like I mentioned before, it's very important to like really ground ourselves into the indigenous culture of our worlds. Um, I think often when we think about um, indigenous cultures, we think about um, folks, indigenous folks from the US, or maybe indigenous folks from, from different Latin American countries or even, even Caribbean um, countries. I know that's something that my people are very proud of. We're very proud of our, of our um, Taino heritage. Um, but we often don't think about that also within our, within our other ancestors um, in the continent of Africa, we also had indigenous people. So indigenous people are really folks that are um, rooted in that place. Like those are the first peoples of that place. Um, and so um, indigenous people from all over the world, especially um, Latin America, the Caribbean and Africa used to be in a in an interchangeable relationship. So traveling, interchanging um, happens often with with folks. And I don't know um, a lot about the indigenous culture of of um, of Europe, for example. But the work that I do know is that um, you know countries like Mexico. Um, what we now know as, as Dominican Republic and Haiti, but the indigenous um, was called Ayiti. Um, and that is like a lot of people think that was actually made, that was actually made up. So the um, indigenous name of what then the colonizers then called Hispaniola is called Ayiti. And, um, and so yeah, so a lot of um, indigenous people were travel and interchange and, and have that kind of relationship. And so within just kind of coded in the way that we that we be as people is very much about about giving and, and exchanging. So that all started changing in the early 1400s um, when European colonizers started to come and explore our, our islands um, and countries and looking for ways to, to extract. Um, and the one, the one specific story that I'm gonna focus on is the transatlantic slave trade. And I also invite you to, to take moments of, of breathing or just moments of, of sipping water, anything that you need to, to care for yourself as you listen to this. And so the transatlantic trans slave trade um, starts bringing um, people from, from, different, from the different African coast to, to this side of, of, of the country. So specifically Latin America, the Caribbean islands, and eventually the, the North coast of the United States. Um, to essentially work work the lands um, and create wealth um, for for European and our North American um, elite wealthy people, and this is after a huge massacre, not a complete elimination, but a huge massacre of indigenous people that were already in these places. Um, uh, massacred through different ways, through through their own through colonizers um, deciding to to murder them, also through colonizers bringing um, different different um, diseases that indigenous people in this country in these countries were not um, 
were not able to, to really live through. And so they died in that way. And also through indigenous people going up to the mountains um, and deciding to live, live life um, on their own. And some of them even deciding to take their own lives to escape the, the, the enslavement. So it's important to really say this, you know, talk about this story because often when we talk about racism or racial equity, where we're not making the connection between the fact that that racism and or just a concept of race um, and this division of, of people was created in order to create to justify to justify this this project this project of colonization through the dif different different um, mechanisms such as the transatlantic slave trade so it wasn't all like um you know a lot of people talk about race being a, a social construct and it is it's a it was a concept created by specifically french and german scientists um who were you know um funneled money by by different european pow powers to say let's create these racial categories so that we can say who's human and who is not and who do you think, based on those racial categories, based on the race, the, the racial categories that we have today, who do you think were classified as the non-human race? You can put it in the chat. So the initial the initial racial categories at the time were um, Caucasoid, which is white, Mongoloid, which is Asian, Australoid, which is indigenous, um, and Negroid, which was black. Exactly, yeah. So you get the concept. So essentially, any anyone that was um, Negroid, Australoid, so indigenous, black people were the people that were kind of that were ca categorized as, as non-human, but specifically for the transatlantic slave trade, um, uh, the, the, the race of Negroid or black people were, were, was the race that was said, okay, these people can be um, enslaved and transported in this way, right? So why do you think that people from Africa specifically were wanted to be enslaved so that they could work the lands. What do you what do you think came with um, black people, but also indigenous people? What were some of the things that they what were some practices, some customs that they already had um, that they were already connected to? You can also put it in the chat. Now remember, I'm talking about um, people who would exchange seeds with each other, talking about people who already had um, um, an innate connection to land. Yes, exactly. So these, um, not just these ideas of being barbaric in nature, but they also were very aware that um, indigenous people and black people had farming techniques, like innately they were people of the land that could work the land um and then connecting that to this concept that they created themselves this is all imagined that they were barbarians that they were you know machines that they could you know um uh take pain in, in ways that 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 the other the other other um, races could not exactly so um this idea is you know this combination like the truth that they knew, but also these imagined ideas that they created were the primary reason why um, black and indigenous people were the perfect people to work the lands. So we go from so now we want to ground in the United States. Um, the way that a lot of enslaved Black people end up in the United States is they kind of go through 
the passage of a lot of a lot of enslaved Black people um, end up coming in through the Caribbean islands and then, or also through some um, countries in, in Latin America, and then they end up making their way um, to the north, um, the north coast, um, the northeast, um, and the south also of the of the United States. And so it goes from essentially today, um, it goes from enslaved Black Americans to immigrants from Latin America, um, the Caribbean, and also Southeast Asia, for example, the Philippines. So today, 80% of our food is grown by people of Latinx, Hispanic descent, but only 3% of farms are owned and controlled by Latinx and Hispanic individuals. And from the 1920s to today, the percentage of Black landowners steadily dropped from 14% to only 1-3% across the, the nation. So it's interesting how even today, um, Black people are still under um, what technically would be uh, right now, even though even though La Latino Hispanic is not a race, it was never a, a race, and people are trying to create make it a race now. It's um, but it's actually uh, just like a heritage. Um, in terms of 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 demographic groups, Black people are still owning less land than. Um, than folks who are from Latin American countries. So that's um, that's very, that's just something very important to, to look at just because throughout time, race and identity has morphed. And um, throughout time, um, you know, white people, or it's like white people had um, certain, um, there was, you know, descendants from very specific countries. And then over time, um, other other countries that are, at, at first were not were not supposed to be white were now invited kind of into the whiteness and we're seeing that a lot within the within the Latinx and the Hispanic um, uh, heritage a lot of people who are you know who are like if you see them you're like okay that person um, because of the way that we have been socially constructed you'll say, yeah, that, per that person is just a white person who speaks Spanish. So, you know, this project of, of racism and race and colonization is still alive and popping, um, unfortunately. And so we're still seeing that, um, kind of that play out in these, in these statistics. Um, so, yeah, so obviously if only 3% and, and one and one percent of Black and Latinx people are owning land. Obviously, the majority of people who are owning land are the descendants of European um, colonizers. And I'm here are just some some statistics um, connected to um, the percentage of people who are farm workers who identify as Latinx versus the percentage of farm managers who identify as Latinx, as well as the income level. So now I want to get into a little bit of the language. This is supposed to go like one by one, but I don't know. I don't know how to work that. So food apartheid um, is essentially the, the concept that uh, people are unworthy of having access to food. Um, and food apartheid affects all, all people of all races, but specifically affects people who are in basically low-income communities. Um, yes, I do have, I'm looking at the chat, I do have some good book recommendations, I can share them after. And then, so the kind of, um, so food apartheid was actually a, a term that got coined or became popular through Miss um, Karen Washington. She's an amazing black farmer from the Bronx, New York. Um, um, she owns a farm in, in New York upstate called Rice and Root and has done, has done some amazing, amazing work. Um, and I, I'm so grateful to have had an opportunity to have you know, been mentored by her, but she's done amazing work all throughout New York and all throughout the United States. And so initially, this we used to call this food deserts, 
um, and basically her sheep said, you know, deserts are are part of part of Mother Nature. Like deserts are are natural things. Um, what we have are not what we have is not natural. What we have is very intentional, right? Which is what we're talking about. All of these all of these systems of oppression are intentional things that are constructed by people um, in power um, who then create systems and institutions um, and projects, as I like to call them. So colonization is a project, racism is a project, food apartheid is a project. Um, so food, so it's very important to, to um, distinguish and, and kind of like course correct our language. So instead of food deserts, you know, calling it food apartheid. And then we have food justice, which is kind of like a um, kind of like a band-aid response to food apartheid. Um, the three main pillars are food access, environmental sustainability, and justice for food workers. So food justice essentially means that people have access. That people have access to food that is healthy, high quality, affordable, culturally relevant, um, and that was produced with minimal harm to earth and animals. And then food sovereignty is the right. So it's, so it goes from just having access to people having autonomy. So sovereignty means being sovereign, being able to have the right to, to who you are as a person. So it's a right of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. So see how this is like, in food justice, we're talking about produced with minimal harm to earth versus food sovereignty is produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. So that's a key difference. We're not just trying to like minimize the harm to earth and like in food justice, we're trying to minimize the harm to earth, but in food sovereignty, we're saying, no, 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 no. We gotta protect mother earth. Like we have to protect our land. Like, and, and, and as, as people who also have the right to our sovereignty, mother earth also has um, the right to, to, to her sovereignty. Um, and then for us to also define our own food and agricultural systems, um, which I think is very important because there is, while there is a blueprint from our ancestors, there also isn't a blueprint from our ancestors. So there's a lot of things that have been passed down orally, um, thankfully, but there's also a lot of things that we have to kind of figure out um, on our own, given all the modernization that, that we experience today. So it's like very important for there to be space, for there to be time, for there to be resources, for us to be able to define how we wanna eat, how we wanna be in relationship to the land. And then also food sovereignty means ending poverty and gives the land access, gives the land access to black and brown people. And that's very, very distinct to food justice because I think, not I think, food justice is very much, let's open up community gardens. Let's have give exactly again. I want to make that key difference between access and giving, right? So there's a difference between we'll allow you. It's basically like we'll let you borrow versus we're gonna give you um, the chance to be a steward of this or to be, or um, you know right now the 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 capitalist word or the word that's mostly used is ownership, but in food sovereignty we're talking about being stewards of the land like having this um, connection, this reciprocal relationship to the land where we give to it, it gives to us and so forth. And we continue that, that, that reciprocal relationship. Um, and also acknowledging, acknowledging that um, the reason that we have a food system, the reason that we have um, you know, these lands that are able to produce food is because of black and brown people, right? Do we have any questions about the, the key difference? I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute. Are any comments or anything that people wanna share about this, this, this key difference between food justice and food sovereignty? Um, or anything that, that has come up, any feelings, any, any thoughts, anything that's coming up for y'all um, so far? Thank you, Tutu, for putting Karen Washington's link. Yeah, definitely check her out. 
Yeah, I just wanted to uplift your distinction of food desert. It's really important that you made that distinction because hunger and food denial is definitely man-made and not of nature. And it's something that can be done about. So it's really important that all of us on this virtual as stewards of this land, that we be very intentional about not just changing narratives, but creating new narratives. And that definitely includes the language and vocabulary that you're presenting to us today. So definitely bless up to you for making that distinction. Thank you, DK. Good to, good to hear your voice. Um, I, I think it's very important that we start really using the, I wouldn't say correct, but I think more, I think we, we continue to, to learn as, as we go. Like, like I mentioned, these are all like, you know, projects and, and, um, and, and violence that has been created by, by, by white colonizers um, throughout time. And so it's very important for us to use, use the language that is most like really lands it, um, no pun intended, like really lands it for what is the violence that we are experiencing, um, but also give, giving ourselves grace because language evolves because we come from a colonized mindset, language is, continue, is gonna continue to evolve the more that we, we dig into, into the true story, right? So now I want us to connect to our stories, um, our connection to, to food and land. Um, and I am really grateful that I kind of came into this work um through community organizing because it really allowed me and also that I came through it through community organizing through mentors and people that were really about embodiment um which essentially just means like being able to connect to your body as a way of of creating of change and as a way of organizing that if we don't organize ourselves inside and we don't figure out who it is that we are why it is that we do this work um, then it makes it very painful to move forward in this work. Now, I'm not saying that that pain is not something that, that will show up because it will, but if you are doing it from a place of um, continuously connecting to who you are as a person, as a being, then you're able to, to process that um, in, in an embodied way. And also you're able to process it, not just through self-care, but through community care. So I want to, if it's possible, to do breakout groups um, and do a partner share um, of what is a me memory that you have from your childhood that's connected to your food and cultural background. Um, and we can spend like five, five minutes, um, two and a half minutes, two and a half minutes for each person. I love this picture. This picture um, my friend took in my house. This is my this is a caldero, a calderon, and it's a it's um, a a tool that that we use in 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 Caribbean, um, specifically in, in Dominican cooking, but I know other other places use it too. But it's just like kind of like quintessential to to Dominican cooking. And then you know you have like the yuca here and and the pottery, um, and so yeah, I have a lot of a lot of just when I look at this, just so many things that can come up for me when I look at like, like, like a caldero. Um, and so that's basically what I'm inviting you to do, inviting you to, to go back, to go back to, to through memory lane and think about a memory that you have um, connected to food um, that's connect, that is um, in alignment with your cultural background. And it does not matter where you're from.
Estimate, I think, I don't know if I'm the only one who can't hear you. Were you talking? Oh yeah, can't hear you. No, no. Testing, testing. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. I said, welcome back, everyone. <laughs> uh, I hope that the conversation was nourishing um, and that you're not as hungry as I am after that conversation. Um, but I'm interested in hearing what were some of the memories that came up for folks who is um, willing to share a few shares before we, we wrap up. Go ahead. All right. So I was saying how, like, I'm from the South and my, um, I'm from Florida, like I stayed in Florida, but a lot of my family moved from like Georgia and like different parts of the South. And so I was talking about how sweet potato pie, like every fall season, that is, that is everything. <laughs> it's like, as soon as like, um, like October hit, I start thinking about that. Mm -hmm. oh yes so good mm -hmm. <laughs> anyone else I can share mine I was with Jacqueline and um uh my okay chai I, I'm gonna say it's it's not traditional to where I come from I'm from Uganda um and it's it's Indian but Uganda had a lot of um folks who came from India and lived there for a really long time so that's why chai is a uh, I think, but um, whenever I smell the spices of chai, it just takes me home. Like wherever I am, I could be in the intersection of Times Square and I smell chai and I just feel home. It just feels so cozy. And it takes me back to a kid having um, tea with my family. Um, and, you know, tea was really great because you could have cookies and cake with it. And it wasn't like, you know, breakfast and lunch where there were things you might not like, but um, I don't know why, but any of the spices in chai just remind me of home. Oh, that also sounds really lovely and cozy and warm and yeah I was I was talking to to Jenny and I was talking about the um, um growing up here in New York and uh in the summers going on beach trips with my family and I was taking like a big uh big pot of um like Dominican spaghettis we call, we call them spaghettis um and just like that um kind of in terms of like cultural heritage Dominicans that have migrated to New York City um and that's just like a, a tradition um that I thought was just like very like normal and then you know kind of grow up and be like not necessarily um usually when Dominicans go to the beach um in DR we just eat fish there um and how it's like a very just like a Dominican New York immigrant thing that we do while we do make um spaghettis in the DR it's not like a, a tradition of like taking it to the beach per se yeah yeah, you can also thank you too. You can also write out your experiences in the chat and we will read them out loud. But okay. um, Janady's hand is up. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, love. Oh, yeah. So um, I actually, for I was talking about a Dominican food experience with Sancocho, which is like this like really big like soup with like everything in it. It's like a stew, my bad, not soup. But basically, my uncle had overcooked it. And he was trying to hide it from my aunt, but like I knew because I I have the like the brain of like being able to know how to cook things, I guess from like growing up and staring at my mom. Um, but um, yeah, he had overcooked it. And then when my aunt got home, she could tell that it was like overcooked, like all the potatoes and like all the different meats and everything. Like they got a little shredded and a little like, I don't know, a little bit like mashed potatoes more than it was a stew. So she could tell. And um, it was just really funny because I proved my uncle wrong. <laughs> and yeah, I, I actually 
had to answer this question from one of my classes and that I, for um I'm in college but yeah um I have to answer for one, my writing class um about food and culture and it was about food memory and that's what I wrote about and so it just that's like what what I connected it to here oh my gosh sorry if you didn't hear me in that last part I accidentally opened something okay yeah Oh, isn't it? You're muted. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for, sh for sharing. Um, definitely resonate with Sancocho, one of my favorite foods. Um, Y'all can keep putting in, the, um, sharing in the chat if you wish, um, but we can um, move forward now. Um, and so we've gone through the, the, the story, we've gone through kind of like the impact of that story. Um, and we've, we've also just connected, connected and been like, this is still the, the, the resistance that kind of lives, lives, um, inside of us and that continues despite all the violence and, and oppression, um, we still can connect to, to joy and memory, um, to food on our land. That's not something that can, um, um, or I think it's not something that can ever be taken away. So um, in addition to that, like how does the work um, and how do how do the how does the story continue? How does food sovereignty actually get to come into um, into more of ex existence? How do we go from you know food apartheid to food justice to food sovereignty? Um, I wanted to share just a few of the work that is is happening. Um, in New York specifically, share my screen again. Okay. So I should have translated this quote. This is a quote that I really like. Um, it's a it's a Maroon's old saying. Um, it translates to "We return to the mountains to live a better life." Um, and kind of similarly to what we've been um, we we're talking about in the beginning, kind of like this idea of returning, this idea of, of also reciprocity. Um, and, and yeah, it's a quote that I, I really love. Um, and I love that it comes from Maroons y Marrones, which are a um, group of of black and indigenous people that would escape to to the mountains and, and kind of created um, their lives up there. And then to the work that's happening now, this is not an extensive list. There is so much work happening. But this is just a few of the ones that are dear to me and that y'all can be plugged in and y'all could look into um, continuing like your, your careers in this. Um, there is the National Young Farmers Coalition, which does a lot of important work and policy, um, um, and also does a lot of work to to give um, opportunities to young farmers to to own land and be farmers. Just because the the not only are we um, the, the number of of black owned and Latinx owned farmers is declining, but also the we're not really seeing a lot of young people kind of like rep replacing the elders. So they do a lot of work to like really um, motivate um, young folks to go into, into farming work. There's also, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't put this. I'm gonna be, whoop. Um, there's Farm School NYC, which is how I got trained to be a farmer, <laughs> an urban farmer. Um, so Farm School NYC is, uh, a very um, a certificate, uh, a citywide certificate program um, in New York City. Um, it pre predominantly focuses on people of color, but anyone can apply. Um, I, I went through that program in 2016, um, and it's an amazing program. Um, that kind of teaches you the gets you from the basics to the most advanced um, things related to um, urban farming and also you can do an apprenticeship. Um, I also teach a course in that in that in that program. Then there's the Black Farmer Fund, which was recently started, um, and it gives um, loans and and money to Black farmers. Um, 
and there's Soul Fire Farm, which is an amazing um, farm. There's so many farms in, in New York and all over, all over the United States. But I think what makes Soul Fire really, really special is their focus on ending racism in the food system. So like their very specific focus on ensuring that that Black people and Indigenous people and the communities that they are, the community that they're in, have access to food and a lot of their work um, in, in undoing racism. Then there's the Black Farmers and Urban Growers Conference. It's like a, it's a, it's a group, but it's also a conference. Um, they have a conference this, um, this fall in Georgia. Um, so if you wanna go out there, I think they're also gonna have some things virtually, but definitely plug into them. Um, there's the Northeast Farmers of Color. They're a, a group and also a really great listserv with a lot of great opportunities, everything from grants to jobs, to, to talks, to um, just so many opportunities. So that's a place to plug in. Um, then there's, in general, urban gardens in New York City. There's so many. Um, I love that a, a lot of the, like the history of urban gardens in New York City comes from like resistance. And actually a lot of people think that urban gardens in New York City is all oh, a place of like peace and harmony. And yes, it is a piece of harmony, but a lot of urban gardens, especially like in East Harlem and in the Bronx, they had to like be broken into. Like people of color broke into those spaces, throws through seeds and we're like, we're gonna grow food if you're not gonna give us access to food. So it's a place of like literally guerrilla, guerrilla urban gardeners um, in New York City. Then there's this um, organization, um, nonprofit that also does um, policy work here in New York called We Act for Environmental Justice, also POC led. Um, a lot of these um, um, organizations are either led by a black woman or there's a lot of um, people of color within with in, in the inside. And there's Woke Foods, the cooperative that I that I started that does um, a little, we don't do policy work, we do more like grassroots community centered work. Um, and I also want to big up Tanya Fields, um, who is a huge inspiration of mine. This is a really old article from 2010. Um, but she um, works in, in the Bronx. Um, she started Libertad Urban Farm. Um, which is translates to freedom farm it was like open to like the whole community i remember you could go there um and get eggs you can still go there and get there's you know there's like a chicken coop you could you could get um eggs at like a really affordable price you could pay with your ebt i remember i would go there with my food stamps and i was able to pay um for eggs and produce um and yeah she's just amazing now she has um another organization called the black feminist project um but yeah tanya feels is definitely a person that you want to plug into um this is some of the work that woke foods has done um we are a transnational co-op at this point we do work in the dominican republic and here in new york city um, and also virtually, um, the pandemic allowed us to imagine virtual work that makes it accessible for folks that are not here nor there. Um, and so we do different um, workshops on growing on growing seeds. We do dinner experiences um, in person where people kind of come to eat plant, a full course plant-based meal, but also kind of get to go through a reiteration of this workshop, but in a, in a, in a more shared meal experience then we have um other we just had this virtual workshop called la politica nuestra comida which translates to the politics in our food and it was like it was just talking about the different um impacts of systems of oppression as it comes to access to food and land in the dr we had um amazing um panelists and we had that at our restaurant in the Dominican Republic. We have a restaurant connected to a community garden out there. Um, and we also had it um, running virtually. We used to do catering in New York City. We've kind of put a pause on that just because there was a lot of things that were lost um, when the pandemic um, was, was um, first started. And so this is like a lot of legal paperwork that we have to go, we have to go through to get back to that, but hopefully in the future we can do that. Um, and there's another, oh, okay, that's it. Um, but yeah, there is really so many avenues you can take. You can take um, 
everything from going, working in policy, working at the grassroots level, working directly as a farmer, working as a farmer educator, um, going into a, a more like a, you know, a, a four year degree, if that's what you wish, you could go the route that I took that was more like a certificate program. Um, you can go the route of, of working as, as a cook, as a farmer, you can mix all of them. I mean, I think that's the beauty of, of, of land and food work that it can really be all the things that, that make you, that, that make it, that make it um, good for you to be in. You could be a seed saver. You could be an herbalist. Um, you can be so many things because the earth is so bountiful and it's need, it needs so many of us to be its stewards um, at the land level, at the food level, at the systems level, even if we don't like the systems, like it, it is, it is kind of the, the, the world that we live in. And so um, I definitely um, invite you to explore everything and anything that sparks your interest. It could also be very niche so it's like, if it doesn't exist, you can create it, which is what I did. Um, and it's really hard work, but there are resources out there and tools and community, um, which is the most important thing of all, doing this in community and doing this um, because it's a passion for you. And it's because so something like you believe in and that we have that at the root of so many systems of oppression, everything really started with land. So thank you so much for, for listening and being here. Um, this is kind of the end of this presentation. And yeah, I'm just so grateful that y'all stayed with me. Oh my God, I'm so sorry for going over time. It's okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Athena. I'm gonna, uh, are there any questions? And maybe one, we can take one or two questions before we uh, we dismiss. Anyone have a question before we leave? Hi, this is Hi, Jenny. Jenny. I have a question. Hi, everybody. I'm Jenny. I'm just here um, joining you today from the Pinkerton Foundation, uh, which supports programs like this one. Um, thank you so much for this presentation today. I learned so much. Um, but I'm curious, like, I know personally for me, my parents always said to me, we worked hard so you didn't have to. And and so we don't want to see you in a like in a job where you're farming, like doing things like farming or um, hard labor. So I'm curious if you have any um, advice. And, and I also hear that from others as well. Like like it's like how 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 can we enter this field if it's something that we're really interested and passionate about? And how do we have those conversations with our families to let them know? why this is so important to us and why this is a path for us. Great question, Jenny. Uh, give me one second. I'm just sure. charging my computer to realize I was dying. <laughs> um, so I will say that I think that comes from, unfortunately, our colonized mindset of seeing um, that work as less than we know that is something that my family has really struggled with everything from my decision to go to farm school to even move back to the Dominican Republic they were like we work so hard <laughs> you're like literally undoing all those things well what they don't see is that this is not an undoing of their hard labor this is a a reclaiming so it's like a reclaiming journey of saying this work became um became like uh to become like less than by the ways by the ways of 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 colonization and oppression like it was it was it wasn't even work it was just a way of life a way of being a way of being our our, our actual culture our actual heritage um our traditions and so being in relation to the land working the land cooking with food from the land, like all these, um, you know, um, what we now call careers were just how we did life. And so that's what I would, that's what I try to remind my family, even if, even if, you know, they dismiss me, my family's very harsh um, and I am often dismissed, but 
at the root of it, I know that it's a process of reclamation for me and of a process of rematriation for me as well. I think Thank something you. we've we've had we've heard during all of our conversations um, through these workshops is is that you know food is essential to all of human life, and that um, that power is taken away from us if we don't have access to food. And so essentially, what we are doing is is, is ensuring that our folks, our community, has um, you know, like you're starting about sovereignty over the food that is coming into our community, so we have access to it, so that we don't find ourselves in these positions where we, that, that food is kept away from us as a power play. So maybe that could be another way to, to talk through. Our communities need to have more autonomy over the food that is getting into our bodies that we're eating, that we're growing, and we can start to pave the way for that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's so many answers to be given in, in terms of, of this, of this work, like, the the story is so deep like we're talking about like 500 plus years of colonization compared to um 1400 years of pre-colonization and so there's yeah there's just a lot of um different different answers to be given um but to say that this work is less than um is yeah, it, it, it comes from a, a colonized place. Thank you. Any other questions before we, maybe we can take one more. Okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll lift up mine. Um, it's Nick, can you tell us how you got involved in food? Why, why was, why did you get involved in food work? Um, you, you did a really great job of taking us through your journey. And I'm curious, like what, what helped you make that decision or what in your life was leading you towards food and farming? Um, I've always loved food. I was very grateful to grow up with both my grandmothers and, um, also that my grandmothers just very were very open to me being in the kitchen and learning with them and also to be um the times I would that I would visit um the Dominican Republic I'd spend a lot of my summers out there and even when I was a young child um my first um my first growing experiences were in the DR because even though I was born in New York I was taken to to the island as a child and went to grade school there and then returned to the to the United States. So I I think those were like my first experiences, but I'd say that I got into food specifically as like, okay, I want to have this as as kind of like my way of life. Um and kind of like how kind of like my the way that I I think I can I can impact the world was through um community organizing work. Um, like I mentioned, I was doing a few of um, some organizing work around police brutality, um, anti-blackness in my own in my own community, um, specifically anti-Haitian sentiment and and policies. And I found that it's it's really hard to do this work um, to be out there, um, you know literally like cop watch is essentially you are following cops around so ensure they don't kill your people and then you know um, racial equity work is teaching people about racism and race and and how to undo their our own anti-black bias and then that's and then there's the work of them me doing that on my own because it's not just coming here and doing a workshop or going to a place but it's then like really dissecting yourself and like really undoing your own your own stuff so um Essentially, all of that became really hard on me and um, through comrades, um, they took me to a, um, a farm where I got to connect to the soil and, and working the land. And that was a really uh, a place of respite for me um, as I was doing community organizing work. And then I started to look at other in other other ways to sustain myself in doing in doing this, and so I started exploring a plant based diet as one of my my wellness practices. Um, um, amongst one of them, I think it's like, I want to really make that distinction that it wasn't like 
that's really all I all I did. But it's I just started exploring like what can I do to sustain my body and my spirit so I can continue doing this work. And then through learning more about about the, the project of colonization and racism, I started I'm like, oh my god, all of all of this is connected to land. Like all of this started from extraction of 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 our peoples to work land, um, so then then that then um, generational white wealth could be created. And I was like, this is if this is where I started, this is where I want to go. Great. Uh, sorry about that musical interlude in the, it wasn't intentional. <laughs> I feel like I was at the Oscars when they're like, um, wrap it up. It was like, wrap no. it up. <laughs> no, we, <laughs> um, no, we're trying to like, uh, to, to end up with like, you know, a musical interlude so it doesn't feel abrupt. That was not my intention at all. But thanks for, thanks for sharing. Thanks for your time. Um, uh i think someone did ask um if you can share the recommendation book recommendations i'll follow up with you about that and i'll send out an email but thank you so much for the work you do and for sharing some of that work with us thank you all for coming and taking part i'm sorry for going over time but we hope you enjoyed this as much as i did so have a good evening and we'll see you all next week bye everyone bye everyone Bye.